Curly by Roger Pocock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Curly by Roger Pocock. Chapter One Apaches. Back in old Texas, twixt supper and sleep time the boys in camp would sit around the fire and tell lies they talked about the ocean which was bigger than all the plains and i began to feel worried because i'd never seen what the world was like beyond the far edge of the grass life was a failure until i could get to that ocean to smell and see for myself after that i would be able to tell lies about it when i got back at home again to the cow camps when I was old enough to grow a little small fur on my upper lip, I loaded my pack pony, saddled my horse, and hit the trail, budding along day after day towards the sunset, expecting every time I climbed a ridge of hills to see the end of the yellow grass and the whole Pacific Oceans shining beyond, with big ships riding herd like cowboys around the grazing whales one morning somewheres near the edge of arizona i noticed my horse throw his ears to a small sound away in the silence to the left it seemed to be the voice of a rifle and maybe some hunter was missing a deer in the distance so i pointed that way to inquire after a mile or so i heard the rifle speaking again and three guns answered sputtering quick and excited that sounded mighty like a disagreement so i concluded i ought to be cautious and roll my tail at once for foreign parts i went on slow approaching a small hill again a rifle shot rang out from just beyond the hill and two shots answered muzzle-loading guns at the same time the wind blew fresh from the hill with a whiff of powder and something else which made my horses shy heat bad smell they snuffed just look at that they signaled with their ears ugh they snorted get up said i and charged the slope of the hill near the top i told them to be good or i treat them worse than a tiger then i went on afoot with my rifle crept up to the brow of the hill and looked over through a clump of cactus at the foot of the hill two hundred feet below me there was standing water a muddy pool perhaps half an acre wide and just beyond that on the plain a burned-out campfire beside a couple of canvas-covered wagons it looked as if the white men there had just been pulling out of camp with their teams all harnessed for the trail for the horses lay some dead some wounded mixed up in a struggling heap as i watched a rifle shot rang out from the wagons aimed at the hillside but when i looked right down i could see nothing but loose rocks scattered below the slope after i watched a moment a brown rock moved i caught the shine of an indian's hide the gleam of a gun barrel close by was another indian painted for war and beyond him a third lying dead so i counted from rock to rock until i made out sixteen of the worst kind of indians apaches all edging away from cover to cover to the left while out of the wagons two rifles talked whenever they saw something to hit one rifle was slow and cool the other scared and panicky but neither was getting much meat for a time i reckoned sizing up the whole proposition while the apaches down below attacked the wagons their sentry up here on the hill had forgotten to keep a lookout being too much interested he'd never turned until he heard my horses clattering up the rocks but then he had yelled a warning to his crowd and bolted one indian had tried to climb the hill against me and been killed from the wagons so now the rest were scared of being shot from above before they could reach their ponies they were sneaking off to the left in search of them off a hundred yards to the left was the sentry a boy with a bow and arrows running for all he was worth across the plain a hundred yards beyond him 
down a hollow was a mounted indian coming up with a bunch of ponies if the main body of the apaches got to their ponies they could surround the hill charge and gather in my scalp i did not want them to take so much trouble with me of course my first move was to up and bolt along the ridge to the left until i gained the shoulder of the hill there i took cover and said abide with me and keep me cool if you please while i sighted took a steady bead and let fly at the mounted indian at my third shot he came down flop on his pony's neck and that was my first meat the bunch of ponies smelt his blood and stampeded promiscuous the apaches being left afoot couldn't attack me none if they tried to stampede they would be shot from the wagons while i hovered above their line of retreat considerably and if they stayed i could add up their scalps like a sum in arithmetic they were plumb surprised at me and some discouraged for they knew they were going to have disagreeable times their chief rose up to howl and a shot from the wagons lifted him clean off his feet it was getting very awkward for those poor barbarians and one of them hoisted a rag on his gun by way of surrender surrender this indian play was robbery and murder and not the honest game of war the man who happens imprudent into his own bear trap is not going to get much solace by claiming to be a warrior and putting up white flags the game was bear traps and those apaches had got to play bear traps now whether they liked it or not there were only two white folks left in the wagons and one on the hill so what use had we for a dozen prisoners who would lie low till we gave them a chance then murderous prompt the man who reared up with the peace flag got a shot from the wagons which gave him peace eternal then i closed down with my rifle taking the indians by turns as they tried to bolt while the quiet gun in the wagon camp arrested fugitives and the scary marksman splashed lead at the hill most generous out of sixteen apaches two and the boy got away intact three damaged and the rest were gathered to their fathers when it was all over i felt unusual solemn running my paw slow over my head to make sure i still had my scalp then collected my two ponies and rode around to the camp there i ranged up with a yell lifting my hand to make the sign of peace and a man came limping out from the wagons he carried his rifle and led a yearling son by the paw the man was tall clean built and of good stock for certain but his clothes were in the lo and behold style a pane of glass on the off eye stand-up collar spotty necktie boiled shirt riding breeches with puffed sleeves most amazing and the legs of his boots stiff like a brace of stove-pipes his near leg was all bloody and tied up with a tourniquet bandage as to his boy jim that was just the quaintest thing in the way of pups i ever saw loose on the stock range he was knee high to a dog but trailed his gun like a man and looked as wide awake as a little fox i wondered if i could tame him for a pet how do you do squeaked the pup as i stepped down from the saddle i allowed i was feeling good i'm sure said the man that we're obliged to you and your friends on the hill in fact very much obliged back in texas i'd seen water go to sleep with the cold but this man was cool enough to freeze a boiler will you um ask your friends he drawled to come down i'd like to thank them i'll pass the glad word said i my friends is in texas my dear fellow you don't all mean to say you were alone engines can shoot said i but they can't hit two of my men are dead and the third is dying i defer to your um, experience but i thought they could um, hit then i began to reckon i'd been some hazardous in my actions it made me sweat to think 
well said i to be civil i calculate i'd best introduce myself to y'all my name's davies i'm lord balshannon said he mighty polite and i'm the honourable jim du chesnay squeaked the kid i took his paw and said i was proud to know a warrior with such heap big names the man laughed well mr balshannon says i your horses is remnants and the near four wheel of that wagon is sprung to bust and them apaches has chipped your leg which it's broke out bleeding again so i reckon you have an eye for detail he says laughing but if you will excuse me now i'm rather busy he looked into my eyes cool and smiling asking for no help ready to rely on himself if i wanted to go a lump came into my throat for i sure loved that man from the beginning mr balshannon says i put this kid on top of a wagon to watch for indians while you dress that wound i'm off he turned his back on me and walked away i'll be back said i busy unloading my pack horse i'll be back i called after him when i bring help at that he swung sudden and came up against me uh, thanks he said and grabbed my paw i'm awfully obliged don't you know i swung to my saddle and loped off for help End of chapter one Chapter Two of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Mike Perard. Chapter Two Lord Balshannon. With all the signs and the signal smokes pointing for war, I reckoned I could dispense with that ocean and stay round to see the play. Moreover, there was this British lord, lost in the desert, wounded some helpless as a baby game as a grizzly bear ringed round with dead horses and dead apaches and his troubles appealed to me plentiful i scouted around until i hit a live trail then streaked away to find people i was doubtful if i had done right in case that lord had got massacred me being absent so i rode hard and at noon saw the smoke of a camp against the tres hermanos mountains it proved to be a cow camp with all the boys at dinner they had heard nothing of apaches out on the war trail but when i told what i knew they came glad on the dead run their wagons and pony herd following we found the britisher digging graves for three dead men and looking apt to require a fourth for his own use uh, good evening says he and i began to wonder why i'd sweated myself so hot to rescue an iceberg jim says he to the boys you'll find some um coffee ready beside the fire and afterwards if you please we will bury my dead the boys leaned over in their saddles wondering at him but the lord's cool eye looked from face to face and we had to do what he said he was surely a great chief that lord balshannon the men who had fallen a prey to the apaches were two teamsters and a mexican all known to these bar white riders and they were sure sorry but more than that they enjoyed this shorthorn this tenderfoot from the east who could stand off an outfit of hostile indians with his lone rifle they saw he was wounded yet he dug graves for his dead made coffee for the living and thought of everything except himself after coffee we lined up by the graves to watch the bluff he made at funeral honors lord balshannon was a colonel in the british army and he stood like an officer on parade reading from a book his black hair was touched silver his face was strong hard manful and his voice quivered while he read from the little book for i am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were oh spare me a little that i may recover my strength before i go hence and am no more sane i reckon that there were some of us sniffing as though we had just caught a cold while we listened to that man's voice 
and saw the loneliness of him afterwards dick bryant the bar y foreman walked straight up to balshannon britisher said he you may be a sojourner and we hopes you are a whole lot but there's no need to be a stranger shake so they shook hands and that was the beginning of a big friendship then balshannon turned to the crown and looked slowly from face to face of us gentlemen he said kind of feeble and we saw his face go gray while he spoke i'm much obliged to you all for uh, co for coming it seems indeed ah that my little son jim and i have made friends and um neighbors i'm sorry that you should find my camp in such ah uh, in such a beastly mess but there's some fairly decent whiskey in this nearest wagon and uh, the man was reeling and his eyes seemed blind when we get to my new ranch at holy cross i i hope your friends ah uh, and and he dropped in a dead faint so long as i stay alive i shall remember that night the smell of the dead horses the silence the smoke of our fire going up straight to a white sky of stars the bar white people in pairs lying wrapped in their blankets around the wagons the reliefs of riders going out on guard the cold towards dawn the little boy jim had curled up beside me because he felt lonesome in the wagon balshannon lay by the fire his mind straying away off beyond our range often he muttered but i could not catch the words and sometimes said something aloud which sounded like nonsense it must have been midnight when all of a sudden he sat bolt upright calling out loud enough to waken half the camp ryan he shouted don't disturb him ryan he's upstairs dying if you fire the shock will ryan don't shoot ryan then with a groan he fell back i moistened his lips with cold tea all right he whispered thanks helen for a long time he lay muttering while i held his hands you see helen he whispered neither you nor the child could be safe in ireland ryan killed my father he seemed to fall asleep after that and counting by the stars an hour went by then he looked straight at me you see dear i turned them out of their farms and ryan wants his revenge so towards morning i put some sticks on the fire which crackled a lot go easy jim i heard him say don't waste our cartridges poor little chap day broke at last the cook was astir and the men rode in from herd i dropped off to sleep it was noon before the heat awakened me and i sat up to find the fire still burning but lord balshannon gone i saw his wagons trailing off across the desert dick bryant was at the fire lighting his pipe with the coal well said he you've been letting out enough sleep through your nose to run an engine going to make this your home the camp's moved sure i've sent the britisher's wagons down to holy cross he bought the place from a mexican last month is it far about twenty mile i've been down there this morning i reckon the people there had smelt apaches and run it was empty and that's why i'm making this talk to you i can't spare my men after today and i don't calculate to leave a sick man and a little boy thar alone i'll stay with them said i that's good talk if y'all need help by day make a big smoke on the roof or if it's night just make a flare of fire i'll keep my outfit near enough to see you reckon there'll be indians none that was a stray band and what's left of it ain't feeling good enough to want scalps but when i got to holy cross this morning i seen this paper and some tracks of the man who left it nailed on the door i said nothing to my boys and the britisher had worries enough already to keep him interested but you ought to know what's coming in case of trouble here's the paper grave city arizona third february eighteen eighty six my lord this is to tell you that in spite of everything you could do to destroy me i'm safe in this free country and doing well i've heard of the horrible crime you committed in driving the poor people from your estate in ireland 
from homes which we and our fathers have loved for a thousand years now i call the holy saints to witness that i will do to you as you have done to me and to my people the time will come when driven from this your new home without a roof to cover you or a crust to eat your wife and boy turned out to die in the desert you will plead for even so much as a drink and it will be thrown in your face i shall not die until i have seen the end of your accursed house signed george bryan these britishers said bryan is mostly of two breeds the lords and the flunkies and you can judge them by the ways they act this mr balshannon is a lord and this year ryan's a flunk if a real man feels that his enemy is some superfluous on this earth he don't make lamentations and post them up on a door no he tracks his enemy to a meeting he makes his declaration of war and when the other gentleman is good and ready they lets loose with their guns in battle this ryan here has the morals of a snake and the right hand of a coward do i give this paper said i to mr balshannon it's his business lad not ours but until this lord is well enough to fight you stands on guard End of chapter two chapter three of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter three holy cross editor's note the walls of holy cross rise stark from the top of a hill on the naked desert and in all the enormous length and breadth of this old fortress there is no door or window to invite attack at each of the four corners stands a bastion tower to command the flanks and in the north wall low towers defend the entrance which is a tunnel through the buildings barred by massive doors and commanded by loopholes for riflemen the house is built of sun-dried bricks the ceilings of heavy beams supporting a flat roof of earth as one enters the first courtyard one sees that the buildings on the right are divided up into a number of little houses for the riders and their families in front is the gate of the stable court on the left are the chapel and the dining hall and in the middle of the square there is a well through the dining hall on the left one enters the little court with its pool covered with water lilies shaded by palm trees and surrounded by an arcade which is covered by creeping plants ablaze with flowers the private rooms open upon this cloister big cool and dark forming a little palace within the fortress walls such is the old hacienda santa cruz which lord balshannon had bought from el senor don luis barrios from the beginning i saw no sign and smelt no whiff of danger either of apaches or of mr ryan when balshannon was able to ride i gave him ryan's letter watched him read it quietly but got nary word from him he looked up from the letter smiling at my glum face shock i said he couldn't we snare a rabbit for jim to play with he and the kid and me used to play together like babies and jim was surely serious with us men for being too young in those days balshannon took advice from bryant our nearest neighbor whose ranch was only one day's ride from holy cross dick helped him to buy good cattle to stock our range and two thoroughbred english bulls to improve the breed then he bought ponies and hired mexican riders so i began to tell my boss and his little son about cows and ponies the range riding driving and holding of stock the roping branding and cutting out how to judge grass to find water to track scout and get meat for the camp the boss was too old and set in his ways to learn new play but jim had his heart in the business from the first growing up to cow punch as though he were born on the range besides that i had to learn them both the natural history of us cowboys the which is surprising to strangers and some prickly being thoroughbred stock 
this british lord and his son didn't need to put on side or make themselves out to be better than common folks like me after the first year when things were settled down and the weather cool lady balshannon came to holy cross and lived in the garden court under the palm trees she was a poor invalid lady enjoying very bad health especially when we had visitors or any noise in the house she never could stand up straight against the heat of the desert on the range i was teacher to jim but in the house this lady made the kid and me come to school for education we used to race neck and neck over our sums and grammar of an evening i guess i was the most willing but the kid had much the best brains he beat me anyways sometimes i got restless sniffing up wind for trouble riding around crazy all night because i was too peaceful and dull to need any sleep but then the boss wanted me in his business the lady needed me for lessons and to do odd jobs the kid needed me to play with and to teach him the life of the stock range so when i got pacific ocean fever they all made such a howl that i had to stay stopping at holy cross grew from a taste into a habit and you only know the strength of a habit when you try to kill it that family had a spring round my hind leg which ain't broken yet the boss made me foreman over his mexican cowboys and major domo in charge of holy cross in the house i was treated like a son with my own quarters servants and horses and my wages were paid to me in ponies until there were three hundred head marked with my private brand some people with bad hearts and forked tongues have claimed that i stole these horses over in mexico i treat such with dignified silence and make no comment except to remark that they are liars anyway as the years rolled on and the business grew mr chalkeye davies became a big chief on the range in arizona when the kid was fourteen years old he quit working cows with me and went to college balshannon missed him some for he took to straying then and would go off in the fall of the year for a bear hunt in the winter to stay with friends and the rest of the time would hang around grave city i reckon the desert air made him thirsty because he drank more then was wise and the need for excitement set him playing cards so that he lost a pile of money bucking against the faro game and monte he left me in charge of his business to round up his calves for branding and his beef for sale to keep the accounts to pay myself and my riders and ride guard for his lady while she prayed for his soul alone at holy cross when jim wanted money at college he wrote to me in all that time we were not attacked by indians ryans or any other vermin upon the level roof of holy cross there was space enough to handle cavalry and a wide outlook across the desert there we had lie-down chairs rugs and cushions and after dinner when the day's work was done we would sit watching the sunset the red afterglow the rich of night coming up in the east the big stars wailing slowly until it was sleep time but when the boy was at college and the boss away from home there was only lady balshannon and me to share the long evenings billy she said once for she never would call me chalkeye billy do you know that i'm dying yes mum and me too but i don't reckon to swim a river till i reach the brink my feet are in the waters billy now i wouldn't hurry mum it may be heaven beyond or it may be disappointing you dear boy she laughed i want to tell you a story i lit a cigarette and lay down at the rugs at her feet i can bear it mum she lay back in her chair brushing off the warm with her fan did my husband ever tell you about a man named ryan not to me no well the ryans were tenant farmers on the balshannon estate at home in ireland they were well-to-do yeomen almost gentlefolk and george ryan and my husband were at school together they might have been friends to-day but for the terrible land league troubles which set the tenants against their landlords it was a sort of smouldering war between the poor folk and our unhappy irish gentry it's not for me to judge 
both sides were more or less in the wrong both suffered the landlords ruined the tenants driven into exile it's all too sad to talk about my husband's regiment was in india then my son was born there rex used to get letters from poor lord balshannon his father who was all alone at balshannon reduced to dreadful poverty trying to do his duty as a magistrate while the wretched peasants had to be driven from their homes his barns were burnt twice the house was set on fire his cattle and horses were mutilated in the fields and he never went out without expecting to be shot from behind a hedge he needed help and at last my husband couldn't bear it any longer he sent in his papers left the profession he loved and went back to ireland he was so impatient to see all his old friends that he wired mr george ryan to meet the train at blandon and drive with him up to balshannon house for dinner nobody else was told that colonel duchesne was coming would you believe it billy those land leaguers tore up the track near blandon station pointing the broken rails out over the river mr ryan was their leader who knew that my husband was in the train nobody else knew no mercifully the train wasn't wrecked the driver pulled up just in time and my husband left the train then and walked up through belshannon park to the house he found his father ill in bed something wrong with the heart and sat nursing him until nearly midnight when the old man fell asleep after that he crept down very quietly to the dining room he found cheese and biscuits and went off in search of some ale when he came back he found mr ryan in the dining room the man was drenched to the skin and scratched from breaking through hedges he said that the police were after him with a warrant on the charge of attempted train wrecking he swore that he was innocent that he had come to appeal to lord balshannon against what he described as a police conspiracy rex told him that the old man was too ill to be disturbed that the least shock might be fatal surrender to me said rex and if the police have been guilty of foul play i'll see that you get full justice at that moment they heard footsteps outside on the gravel and peeping out through the window mr ryan found that the police had surrounded the building he charged rex with setting a trap to catch him he pointed a pistol in my husband's face don't fire said rex my father is upstairs very ill and if you fire the shock may be fatal don't fire mr ryan fired the bullet grazed my husband's head and knocked him senseless when he recovered he found that ryan had escaped nobody knows how and a sergeant of the royal irish constabulary told him that the police were in hot pursuit he heard shots fired in the distance and that made him frightened for his father he rushed out of the room and halfway up the staircase found the old man lying dead the shock had killed him lady i said if i were the boss i'd shoot up that ryan man into small scraps billy you've got to save my husband from being a murderer ryan said i ain't eligible for the grave until he meets up with balshannon's gun promise me to save my husband from this crime but i can't promise to shoot up this ryan myself he's balshannon's me not mine you must dissuade my husband i'll dissuade none between a man and his kill oh what shall i do she cried is your son safe i asked while ryan lives why do you say that didn't your man drive all the people off the balshannon range and make it a desert alas may he be forgiven will ryan forgive is your son safe i sat dead quiet while the lady cried when a woman stampedes that way you can't point her off her course or she'd mill round into hysterics you can't head her back for she'd dry up hostile so it's best to let her have her head and run when she's tired running she'll quit peaceful i lit a cigarette and began to round up all the facts in sight then to cut the ones i wanted and let the rest of the herd adrift when our balshannon outfit first camped down in holy cross this ryan began to accumulate with his family in the nearest city this being grave city one hundred miles west grave city was new then a yearling of a city 
but built on silver and undercut with mines ryan took chance by the tail and held on starting a livery stable then a big hotel while he dealt in mines and helped poor prospectors to find wealth so ryan bogged down in riches the leading man at grave city with daughters in society and two sons at college only this ryan was shy of meeting up with lord balshannon and i took notice year after year that when my boss went to the city mr ryan happened away on business some one was warning ryan lady said i so sudden that you forgot to go on crying you've warned ryan again and again how do you know that billy it's a hundred mile ride to grave city but it's only sixty to lordsburg on the railroad every time the boss goes to grave city you send off a rider swift to lordsburg he telegraphs from there to grave city messages to my husband and warnings to ryan she was struck silent you're saving up ryan until he gets the chance to strike oh how can you say such things besides mr ryan's afraid that's why he runs away ryan ain't playing no common bluff with guns the game he plays ain't killin he wants you all alive like a cat wants mice i don't know how i don't know when but here are the words he nailed on to the door of this house before lord balshannon came the time will come when driven from your home without a roof to cover you or a crust to eat your wife and boy turned out to die in the desert you stop stop she screamed promise me lady that you'll send no more messages to ryan it's murder no lady this is a man's game called war i promise she whispered i'll send no more warnings End of chapter 3chapter four of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter four the range wolves that same winter lord balshannon came down from lordsburg on the railroad by way of bryant's ranch and tracked my round-up outfit to our camp at laguna that was the spot where the patron and i fought the apache raiders but since then we had built corrals beside the pool the ring fences which are used for handling livestock i had twenty mexican vaqueros with me branding calves and the patron found us all at supper while we ate he told me the news how dick bryant was elected sheriff of the county how mr ryan's eldest son had left college and gone into business in new york how three bad men had been lynched by the vigilance committee at grave city and how low-lived joe had shot up two mexicans for being too obstreperous at cards the boss had always some gossip for me at tea time after supper he passed me a cigar chaka said he give these boys as much sleep as you can at midnight you can pull out of camp for wolf gap strike in there at the first streak of dawn gather the whole of our horses then run them as hard as you can to holy cross and throw them into the house indians i asked no horse rustlers bryant gave me the office that some outlaws have come down from utah they've heard of our half-bred ponies and they are in need of remounts we've only two days forage at the house after tomorrow let the herd into the home pasture under a strong guard by day throw them into the house every night and post a relief of sentries on the roof we mustn't ha allow the poor robbers to fall into temptation so see that the men have um plenty of ammunition these robbers may round up our cattle if they do they will have to drive slow and bryant will hold the railway line in force with troops if necessary and um, chalk eye yes sir a friend of mine has turned this gang loose on my stock there's been crooked work ryan work sir what makes you think that the birds i want leave to go shoot ryan indeed ah oh, i've promised my wife not to uh shoot mr ryan 
he stood up and grabbed my paw chalkeye we must try to behave like eh, christians for her sake now i must be off you'll find me at holy cross at noon next day i brought our herd to holy cross and watered all the horses at the dam below the house this dam crossed a small hollow holding some two or three acres of water directly under the western wall of the hacienda some old trees sheltered the water and one of these had been blown down by a gust of wind as i drove the remuda to the gates one of the mares got snarled up in the wrecked tree broke her leg and had to be shot then i threw the herd into the stable court and went to my quarters i reckon that i had been thirty-four hours in the saddle and used up five horses so i wanted much to get my eye down for a little sleep while the peon pulled off my boots i gave orders mixed with yawns to my segundo take a charge teniente and report my obedience to el senor don rex post a guard of four in the gatehouse close the gates and place a relief of sentries on the northwest bastion if the sentry sees anybody coming the guard is to call me at once see that my riders get sleep till sundown then send a couple of them to haul that dead mare from the waterhole i had not slept an hour when a man from the guardhouse came running to wake me up i jumped into my boots grabbed my gun and bolted to the gates where balshannon joined me at the spy hole who's coming he asked a white man patron and a boy on the dead run message from bryant eh let them in i swung the gates wide open and we stood watching the riders a middle-aged stockman and a young cowboy burning the trail from the north as they came surging up the approach i reckon their horses smelt a whiff of blood from that dead mare beside the waterhole horses go crazy at the smell of blood and though the man held straight on at a plunging run for the gates the boy lacked strength to control his mare when she swerved he spurred then she began to sunfish throwing one shoulder to the ground and then the other while she bucked at this the youngster lost his nerve and tried to dismount the same being the shortest way to heaven for when the mare felt his weight come on one stirrup she made a side spring leaving him in the air then bolted dragging him by the foot while she kicked the meat from his bones he was surely booked right through to glory but for balshannon my boss was a quick shooter and accurate so that his first bullet caught the mare full between the eyes and dropped her dead in her tracks i raised the long yell for my men as we rushed to get the boy from under her body it seemed to me at the time that the elder man never reigned but made a clear spring from his galloping horse to the ground reaching the mare with a single jump before she had time to drop grabbing her head he swung his full weight and threw her falling body clear of the boy when we reached the spot he was kneeling beside him in the sand stunned he said that's all say he looked up at the patron and saw the tears were starting from his eyes sir you saved my son's life with that shot i reckon his voice broke with a sob you sure made me your friend nothing broken i hope said balshannon no sir the stirrup seems to have twisted this foot i sent some men for a ground sheet in which the boy could be carried without pain balshannon sent for brandy still kneeling beside his son the stranger looked up into the patron's face you are lord balshannon he asked at your service my good fellow well do any of your greasers speak our language i fancy not then i have to tell you sir that i am captain mccalmont and my outfit is the robber's roost gang of outlaws he was bending down over his son i ask no question my friend said lord balshannon we never question a guest you make me ashamed sir i came with a parcel of lies to prospect around with a view to doing you dirt balshannon chuckled and i saw by the glint in his eye that he was surely enjoying this robber you'll dine with me said he captain mccalmont looked up sharply to see what game the patron was playing you will notice captain said the boss that my house is like a deadfall trap indeed ah yes only one door you see 
for answer the robber unbuckled his belt and let it fall to the ground take my gun he said do you suppose i daren't trust you son a servant had brought the brandy and mccalmont rubbed a little on his son's face then poured a few drops between his teeth presently the lad stirred moaning a little let's take him into the house said i no mr chalkeye davies answered the robber not until this gentleman knows some more a whole lot more here curly he whispered wake up bo the lad opened his eyes clear blue like the sky and smiled at his father air you safe dad he whispered sure safe curly closed his eyes and lay peaceful the hold-up was squatting back on his heels looking out across the desert don rex said he i had a warning sent to sheriff bryant that i was coming down to lift all your hosses my wolves tracked bryant's rider to lordsburg where he wired to you you came running and had all your hosses rounded up convenient for me in the stable yard of this house i thank you sir my good man i'll bet you an even thousand dollars said the patron that you don't lift a hoof on my hot ramuda it's a spotting off em and tempts me answered the outlaw oblige me by taking my gun from the ground here and firing three shots in the air the patron took the gun and at his third shot saw a man ride out from behind the bastion on our right mccalmont waved to him and he came putting a silk mask over his face as he rode then halted in front of us shy as a wolf gun ready for war young man said mccalmont repeat to these gentlemen here the whole of yo orders for the day leave out the names of the men you're giving us dead away said the rider threatening mccalmont with his gun you mean that i mean what i say uh excuse me mccalmont said the patron your uh pistol i think thanks sir mccalmont took the gun repeat the orders he said these gentlemen are our friends well you know us best came the voice from behind the mask three men to cover your approach to holy cross and if there's trouble to shoot balshannon and chalkeye they're covered now the wall of the stable court by the southwest bastion to be mined with dynamite and touched off at ten p m prompt ten riders to get in through the breach in the wall and drive out the bunch of horses one man with an axe to split all the saddles in the harness room then join the herders leave out said mccalmont all detail for pointing swinging and driving the herd go on at one minute to ten before the wall is blown away ten riders are to make a bluff at attacking the main gate and keep on amusing the garrison until the men with the naphtha cans have fired the private house rendezvous for all hands at laguna by midnight where we catch remounts and sleep until daybreak with a night herd of two and one camp guard at dawn we begin to gather cattle while the horse wrangler and two men drive the remuda east rendezvous at wolf gap lord balshannon laughed aloud <laughs> and how about poor old bryant's posse of men he asked sheriff bryant said the captain allows that he's to catch us in a sure fine trap five miles due west of lordsburg and now he called to the mounted robber tell the boys that all orders are cancelled that i'm supping tonight at holy cross and that the boys will wait for me at the place we fix in case of accidents the man rode off hostile and growling aloud while balshannon stood watching to see which way he went my comet said he and i took note of just one small quiver in his voice may i venture to ask one question a hundred sir you seem to know the arrangement of my house its military weakness how did you learn that the outlaw stood up facing him and took from the breast of his shirt a folded paper belshannon and i spread it open and found a careful plan of holy cross at the foot of the paper there was a memorandum signed george ryan i may tell you said the robber that if i succeeded in burning your home stealing your horses and running your cattle mr george ryan proposed to pay my wolves the sum of ten thousand dollars 
carry out your plans the patron was pleased all to pieces i'd love to fight your wolves i've got some dynamite too think of what you're losing lose nothing said the robber i'll collect fifty thousand dollars compensation from ryan he stooped down and gathered his son in his arms and now will you have us for guests in your home say the word and we go belshannon lifted his hat and made a little bow much polite my house he answered in spanish is yours senor End of chapter four chapter five of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter five back to the wolf pack being given to raising fowls i'm instructed on eggs a whole lot killed young an egg is a sure saint being a pure white on the outside and inwardly a beautiful yellow but since she ain't had no chance to go bad she's not responsible but when an egg has lingered in this wicked world exposed to heat cold and other temptations she succumbs becoming weary of her youth and shamed of virtue so she participates in vice to the best of her knowledge and belief yes an old egg is bad every time and the more bluff she makes with her white and holy shell the more she's rotten inside a whited sepulchre i reckon it's been the same with me for at holy cross i was kept good and fresh by the family shell white and yolk i was a good egg then with no special inducements to vice now i know in my poor old self what an uphill pull it is trying to reform a stale egg in those days when i thought i was being good on my own merits i had no mercy on bad eggs like poor mccalmont however much he tried to reform balshannon took me aside and wanted to know if he could trust this robber so far as you can throw a dog said i that night the lady fed alone and we dined in the great hall the patron at the head of the table mccalmont and curly on one side the padre and me on the other curly's ankle being twisted and wrapped up most painful in wet bandages the priest allowed that he couldn't ride away with his father but had better stay with us curly shied at that i won't stay none he growled but mccalmont began to talk for curly explaining that robbery was a poor vocation in life full of uncertainties he wanted his son to be a cowboy if he rides for me says i he'll have to herd with my mexicans they're greasers but curly's white and they won't mix i'd rather says mccalmont for arizona cowboys are half wolf anyway but this outfit is all dead gentle and good for my cub then the boss offered wages to curly and the priest took sides with him so curly kicked and i growled but the boy was left at holy cross to be converted and taught punching cows as to mccalmont he rode off that night gathered his wolves and jumped down on mr george ryan at the jim crow mine near grave city he wanted compensation for not getting any plunder out of holy cross so he robbed mr ryan of seventy thousand dollars the newspapers in grave city sobbed over poor mr ryan and howled for vengeance on mccalmont's wolves curly read the newspaper account and was pleased all to pieces then he howled all night because he was left behind it took me some time to get used to that small youngster who was a whole lot older and wiser than he looked he had a room next to my quarters where he camped on a bed in the far corner and acted crazy if ever i tried to come in because he insisted on keeping the shutters closed that room was dark as a wolf's mouth a sort of den where one could see nothing but his eyes glaring green or flame-colored like those of a panther if he slept he curled up like a little wild animal one ear cocked one eye open ready to start broad awake at the slightest sound once i caught him sucking his swollen ankle 
which he said was a sure good medicine i have seen all sorts of animals dress their own wounds that way but never in a human except little curly as to his food he would eat the things he knew about but if the taste of a dish was new to him he spat as if he were poisoned at first he was scared of lady balshannon hated the patron and surely despised me but one day i saw him limping attended by four of our dogs and a brace of cats across to the stable yard i sneaked upstairs to the roof and watched his play there must have been fifty ponies in the yard and every person of them seemed to know curly for those who were loose came crowding round him and those who were tied began whickering horses have one call soft and low which they keep for the man they love and one after another gave the love cry for curly he treated them all like dirt until he came to rebel an outlaw stallion once rebel tried to murder a mexican several times he had pitched off the best of our bronco busters always he acted crazy with men and savage with mares yet he never even snorted at curly but let that youngster lead him by the mane to a mounting block then waited for him to climb up and trotted him round the yard tame as a sheep curly said i from the roof and the boy stiffened at once hard and fierce curly that horse is yours i know that said curly can't you see for yourself the dogs loved curly first then the horses and next the mexican cowboys but at last he seemed to take hold of all our outfit he thawed out slowly to me then to the patron and the old priest afterwards even to lady balshannon so we found out that this cub from the wolf pack was only fierce and wild with strangers but inside so gentle that he was more like a girl than a boy he was rather wide at the hips bow-legged just a trace and when his ankle healed we found he had a most tremendous grip in the saddle the balance of a hawk yes that small slight delicate lad was the most perfect rider i've seen in a world of great horsemen the meanest horse was tame as a dog with curly while in tracking scouting and natural sense with cattle i never knew his equal yet as i said before he was small weak badly built more like a girl than a boy with strangers he was a vicious young savage with friends like a little child he did a year's work on the range with me and that twelve months i look back to as a sort of golden age at holy cross we were raising the best horses and the finest cattle in arizona prices were high and the patron was too busy to have time for cards or drink over at grave city and even the lady braced up enough to go for evening rides and then the honorable james du chesney rode home to us from college the patron and his lady were making a feast for their son the cowboys were busy as a swarm of bees decorating the great hall the padre fluttered about like a black moth getting in everybody's way so curly and i rode out on the lordsburg trail to meet up with the honorable jim i hate him curly snarled why for boy dunno i hate him i told curly about my first meeting with that same little boy jim aged six and him turning his hot gun loose against hostile indians shooting gay and promiscuous scared of nothing i hate him snarled curly between his teeth last night the lady was reading to me yonder on the rooftop well there was a big chief on the range an old longhorn called abraham and his little old squaw sarah they'd a boy in their lodge like me another woman's kid not a son but good enough for them while they was plumb lonely that ishmael coke was sure wild came of bad stock like me his hand says the book will be up again every man and every man's hand again him i reckon that colt came of robber stock same as me but i allow they'd liked him some until their own son came then their own son came a surely heap big warrior called isaac and the old folks 
they didn't want no more outlaw colts running loose around on their pasture they surely turned that ishmael out to die in the desert look up thar chalkeye in the north and you'll see this isaac a comin on the dead run for home Curly, says i this young chief won't have no use for old chalkeye he'll want to boss on his own home range and it's time he started in responsible to run holy cross at the month's end i quit from this outfit and i'm taking up a ranch five miles on the far side of grave city thanks to the patron i've saved ponies and cattle enough to stock my little ranch yonder will you come at forty dollars a month and punch cows for chalkeye no i won't never i come from the wolf pack and i'm going back to the wolf pack to be a wolf that's where i belong thar in the desert he swept out his hand to the north and there over a rise of the ground i saw young jim de chesney coming on the dead run for home End of chapter five chapter six of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by macroy chapter six my range whelps whimpering now that i have won through the dull beginning of this story i've just got to stop and pat myself before going on any further there were steep bits on the trail where i panted for words rocks where i stumbled holes where i bogged down to the hawks crossroads where i curved around lost at the best i had a poor eye a lame tongue and a heap big inclination to lie down and quit so i've done sure fine to keep a going ride me patient still for i'm near the beginning of the troubles which picked up jim curly and me to whirl us along like a hurricane of fire soon we'll break gait from a limp to a trot from trot to canter then from lope to gallop i suppose i had better explain some about grave city and how we got to have such a cheerful name that was away back in eighteen seventy eight when two prospectors ed shifflin and his brother pulled out to explore the desert down by the mexican boundary the boys allowed they'd better take their coffins along with them because if they missed being scalped by apaches or wiped out by border ruffians or starved to death they would surely perish of thirst the only thing you boys will find is your grave well they called their discovery grave city but it was one of the richest silver mines on earth and a city grew up here in the desert for the first few years it was most surely hot full of artists painting the town red and shooting each other up with a quick gun that was the time of man-killer johnson curly bill rushin george brazelton of tucson the robber and a young gentleman aged twenty-two called billy the kid who wiped out twenty fellow citizens and followed them rapid to a still warmer climate when these gentlemen had shot each other for their country's good and a great many more died a natural death by being lynched the city got more peaceful in the second year it was burnt and entirely rebuilt in a fortnight the first large gambling joint was called the sepulchre the first weekly paper was the weekly obituary and in the eighth year mr ryan built his hotel the mortuary that was in eighteen eighty six the year of the apache raids when i went with the new patron to holy cross twelve years i rode for balshannon then jim being in his eighteenth year took charge as foreman and major-domo of that grand old ranch it was the fourth of july nineteen hundred before i saw that youngster again we gathered at grave city then to celebrate the birthday of our great republic and it does me good every time to see our flag old glory waving above the cities of freedom the honorable jim must needs run a mayor of his at the races the same as i told him being suitable meat to bait traps i made him an offer for that mare ten cents for her tail as a fly switch a dollar for her hide 
and a five-cent rim-fire cigar if he would dispose of the other remains. He raced her, lost one thousand dollars, and came to me humble for the money to pay his debts. I told him to burn his own paws in his own fire and be content with his own howls. They're debts of honor, says he. Debts of honor, and you're the dishonorable James Do idiot. There's your traveling pony been standing saddled all day in the blazing heat without a fee or a drink. You call yourself a horseman? Afterwards, we smoothed out fur and had our supper together. Jim promised to be good, go home, do his honest cowboy work, and look after the poor lone lady who was dying by inches at a holy cross. Yet I was proud of that boy, keen, fierce, stubborn as a wild ass, with the air and temper of a thoroughbred, and a laugh which spoiled me for preaching. He was smart, too, in a new shirt of white silk, a handkerchief round his neck, striped cream and rose color, Mexican trousers of yellow leather studded down the seams with lumps of turquoise stones and silver settings, big silver spurs, and on his belt a silver-mounted forty-five Colt revolver. I've got no earthly use for a boy who slouches. At supper, while I preached, he called me an old fool for caring when he was bad. Then he told me goodbye in the dusk and set off on his hundred-mile trail for Holy Cross. I rode home thoughtful and lay long awake in my little dobe cabin at Los Salinas, thinking about that boy whose mother was sick and his father riding to shirk destruction, a gambler, a drunkard, hopeless, lost, the best friend I ever had in the world. When I woke, the faint light of dawn shone through the cabin window and brightened the saddles on the wall. Something was touching my face, something cold, so I grabbed it quick, a little small hand. Then I heard Curly's low, queer laugh. You, Chalkeye, he whispered. He was sitting on the stool beside my bunk, dead weary, covered with dust from the trail. Somehow the boy seemed to have got smaller instead of growing up, and he sure looked weak and delicate for such a life as he led. Twenty years old, he didn't seem fifteen, and yet he spoke old-fashioned, heaps wise and experienced. Where are you from? says I, yawning. Speak low, and no questions, said Curly in a hard voice, for on the range we never ask a guest his name, or where he comes from, or which way he goes. When he comes, we don't need to tell him any welcome. When he goes, we say, adios, for he'll sure have need of an almighty father out in the desert. Shock eye, says my wolf. Are you alone? Sure. No boys over thar in your ram pasture? My riders is wolfing in Grave City, but they'll stray back for noon. Hide me up in your barn for the day, then. And your horse, Curly? Say you won him last night at Cowards. We'll hide the saddle. Have coffee first? I surely will and kneeling stiff, weary by the heart, he began to make up a fire. There's a notice up for you, Curly. They're offering two thousand dollars, dead or alive. For robbing that Union Pacific train? I reckon. Chaka, did you ever know me to lie? None, Curly. Then you'll believe me. I wasn't there when our wolves got that train. I've never done no robberies ever yet. I hope you never may. Sometimes I hope so, too. He was holding up his hands before the fire. How's the patron? he asked, as he put on the coffee pot to boil. Going downhill rapid. He's mortgaged Holy Cross to the last dollar. What's his play? Pharaoh and Monty, you'll see him bucking the game all night down at the sepulchre. He drinks hard now. Poor old um, chap, don't you know? And the lady? Dine out, down at the hacienda. The father sits with her. And the young chief? Do you still hate him? Why should I care? Tell me on the dead thief, Curly. You do care some. What happens to Holy Cross? Don't you remember old Ryan inviting your wolves to eat up the hacienda? They had stewed Ryan for breakfast afterwards, and he sure squealed. Yesterday I seen a bar keep 
who belongs to Ryan, go up against young Jim and rob him of a thousand dollars over a sure thing horse race. Any day you'll see Ryan's hired robbers running the crooked barrel and monte games where Balshannon is losing what's left of Holy Cross. Ryan hired the range wolves, and they went straight for his own throat. But now the town wolves are eating your best friends. The only friends I have, except my gang, said Curly. Why don't you shoot up them town scouts and that Ryan? My gun against a hundred, Curly? No, I tried to get those crooks run out of the city, but Ryan's too strong for me. If I shoot him up, I'd only get lynched by his friends. Show me your cards, old Chaka. Let me see you play. I aim to turn the range wolves loose in Grave City. The range wolves is some fastidious, Chalkeye, and wants clean meat for the kill. You don't want to save your friends? The boss wolf leads, not me, and he wants good meat. I must point to good meat, or he ain't hungry none. Ryan has lots of wealth. We ate some once, and he's got monotonous. How about his son, the millionaire? My wolves would surely enjoy a millionaire, but shucks, we'll never get so much as a smell at him. Can't you suggest some plan for checking Ryan? I'll think that over. I calculate to spend some weeks in Grave City. Two thousand dollars, dead or alive. Why, lad, you're crazy. When I'm disguised, you'll never know it's me. Disguised? As how? As a woman, perhaps. Or maybe as a man. I don't know yet. I went to sniff the morning. At the door found Curly's horse, loaded with an antelope, lashed across the saddle. I shot you some meat for your camp, said Curly, throwing coffee into the boiling pot. Now, let's have breakfast. I went out and caught some eggs. Then we had breakfast. End of chapter 6「Seven of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Seven At the Sign of Ryan's Hand. At the time of Curly's visit, I was breaking in a bunch of fool ponies, and long in August sold them to the Lawson Cattle Company. Their flying W outfit was forming up just then for the fall roundup. So by way of swift delivery, I took my ponies down by rail to Lordsburg. Their camp was beside the stockyard, and the little old cow town was surely alive with their cowboys, stamping new boots around to get them used, shooting off their guns to show how good they felt, filling up with chocolate creams and pickles to while the time between meals, sampling the whiskey the games and the druggist sure thing medicines or racing ponies for trial along the street now i reckon that the sight and smell of a horse comes more natural to me than anything else on earth while the very dust from a horse race gets into my blood and i can't come near the course without my head getting rattled but from the first whiff of that town i caught the scent of something going wrong for most of the stockyard was full of cattle branded with the cross, and the Holy Cross vaqueros were loading them into a train. Moreover, by many a sign I gathered fact on fact that this delivery of Balshannon's cattle was out of the way of business, not a shipment of beef to the market, but a sale of breeding stock, which meant nothing short of ruin. I strayed through that town feeling sick refusing to drink with the punchers, or talk cow with the cattlemen, or take any interest, and laugh. At the post office, I met up with Jim, face to face, and he tried to pass by short-sighted. Boy, said I, as I grabbed him, why for air you shake? Leave me go, he snarled. For why, son? Cause I'm shamed of yourself? Shamed of my father. Our breeding stock is gone to pay his gambling debts. All of it? What's left is awful. Now you leave me go. War too. 
to follow Balshannon's trail, drink, gambling, shame, death, and a good riddance. You come with me first, says I, for an oyster stew and some bare sign. I ain't ate since it's sun up. He came with me for a stew and the doughnuts, which made him feel some better in his heart. And after that I close herded him until the cattle were shipped through the evening, through the night, and on to daybreak. And then I rounded up his greaser cowboys from various gambling joints and pointed him and them for Holy Cross. Boy, says I at parting, you've been at work on the range for long months now, and your mother is surely sick for the sight of your fool face. Go home. You old chalk frog, says he, with a grin as wide as the sunrise. You're getting rid of me because you want to have a howling time on your lonesome with all that money you got for your rotten ponies. It was surely fine sight to see my Jim hit the trail, the silver fixings of his saddle and cowboy harness bright as stars, his teeth a flash, his eyes a shining as he stooped down to give me cheek at parting and lit out with his tail up for home. His rider saluted me as their old chief in passing, calling, Buenos dias, senor, adios. Yes, they were good boys, with all their dark skin and their habit of missing the wash time, like built riders with big soft eyes always watchful, grave manners, gentle voices, gay laughter, and their beautiful Spanish talk like low thunder rolling. They were brave as lions, they were true as steel, and foolish only in the head, I reckon. So they passed by me, one by one, saluting with a lift of the cigarette, a glimpse of the eye, dressed gorgeous in dull gold leather, bright gold straw sombreros, rainbow-colored serapes, spur and gun a flash, reins taut, and horses dancing, and were gone in a cloud of dust and glitter away across the desert. I was never to see them again. It made me feel quite a piece wistful to think of Holy Cross down yonder, beyond the rim of the far grass, for that house had been more than home to me, and that range was my pasture where I had grazed for twelve good years. I could just judge, too, how Jim was wanted for home swift, while the Segundo, good old Juan Terrazas, would pray the young lord to spare the little horses. Tis sixty leagues, and these our horses are but children, senor. Confound the horses, says Jim. Let's burn the trail for home. Roll your trail, Pedro. Vamanos. But the child horses, my lord, grass-fed only in the hot desert. Roll your tail, and roll it high. We'll all be angels by and by. And Jim would lope along with a glad heart, singing the round-up songs. Little black bull came down the hillside down the hillside down the hillside little black bull came down the hillside long time ago then he would go on some more happy when he thought of the big tune to roll powder roll as i heard afterwards the outfit was rounding the shoulder of the hill about five miles out when on the ridge beyond mr jim's bright eye took note of something alive a vulture only, my lord, says the segundo, eating a dead horse. A quart of kittens, says my lord, some scornful. Call that a vulture? And off he sailed, clattering down a slope of loose rocks. That bird is a man-bird flapping at us for help. Segundo, you've no more range of sight than a boiled owl. The segundo came grumbling along behind, and they curved off across the level. That man has lost his horse, says Jim, thirsty, I guess, and signaling for help. Go back, Terrazas, and tell the men to wait. Si, sí, senor, and Terrazas rolled back to the trail. As Jim got nearer, he saw that the man on the hill had signaled nothing, but his coattails were a flutter in the wind. Now he came all flapping from rock to rock down the hillside. Hello, Jim shouted. The stranger squatted down on a rock to wait for him, and sat wiping his face on a red handkerchief. He was dressed all in black, a sky scout 
of sorts but dusty and making signs as though he couldn't shout for thirst jim took his half-gallon canteen ranged up and dismounted curious he was thinking lips not swollen tongue not black this man ain't thirsty much my dear young friend says the preacher between drinks you're the means under heaven of my deliverance go from a shocking end scared you'd have to go to heaven asked jim i was afraid gulp that i must give up my labors in this vale of gulp for which i was found unworthy is that so sir i have walked far and am much exhausted jim looked at the preacher's pants and saw that a streak of the cloth from knee to ankle was dusty none the same being the mark of the stirrup leathers he could not have walked a hundred yards from his horse stranger says jim your horse is just on the other side of this hill yes indeed but it never lets me get any nearer and i've chased it for miles i'll catch your horse jim swung to his seat spurred off circled the hilltop and found the preacher's horse reined to the ground unable to trot without being tripped at once dead easy to catch at one jump this parson man was a liar anyway then something caught jim's eye a sort of winking star on a hill crest far to the east he watched that star winking steady to right and left the thing was a heliograph making talk as he supposed to the preacher and jim watched harder than ever he couldn't read the signs so wondering most plentiful he spurred up to find out if anything more could be seen from the crest of the hill yes there lay the railroad and the town of lordsburg plain as a map this preacher had been sly and heaps untruthful so jim rode back leading his horse but kept the sights he had seen for his own consumption i shall thank you sir says the preacher alas that i should be so poor a horseman my sacred calling has given me no chances of learning to ride like y'all jim watched him swing to the saddle as only a stockman can you may dress a puncher in his last coffin but no disguise short of that will spoil his riding maybe says the preacher you can favor me with a few hints on the art of setting a wool hoss and if you please we will go more gradual because the motion is pitching my poor kidneys up through my neck whoa yow jim broke away at a trot sitting side saddle to enjoy the preacher who jolted beside him like a sack of dogs stranger says he the trail is where my men are waiting yonder to the left it goes to lordsburg to the right it runs straight to bryant's and on to holy cross good morning sir and he left on the dead run my dear young friend the preacher wailed at him whoa whoa now i've got mislaid i place myself in your hands jim reigned well where do you want to go i want to find a wild sinful young man by the name of duchesney he's the honorable james duchesney perhaps you know him partly well what's your business with him i suffer says the preacher from clergyman's sore throat a heap permit me sir to ride with you while i explain my business as you please they had gained the trail and jim swung into it with the preacher calling back to his riders to keep within range astern besides says the preacher coughing behind his hand i am somewhat timid there are so many robbers that i yearn for your company for protection jim yelled back to his men in spanish boys just watch this stranger he's no good keep your guns handy and if he tries to act to crooked shoot prompt thank you sir says the preacher and now your business quick it appears the preacher groaned that some wicked men have been behaving deceitfully in the purchase of a flock of cows from this young gentleman eh yes they paid for his flock with a draft made in favor of lord balshannon on the national bank at grape city what a dreadful name for a city suggested of rats go on ma'am 
this draft on the bank from jebby's y stone who bought your cattle sir you forwarded from lordsburg yesterday it will be presented to-day by lord balshannon at the bank in grave city how do you know unhappily my sacred calling has left me quite unfamiliar with the carnal affairs of this most wicked country well what's wrong the bank wired yesterday morning that they held money to meet this draft stone showed me the telegram up to noon said the preacher there was money in the bank some forty thousand dollars in the name of jebby's y stone ready to meet your draft and pay for the cattle i know that at noon yesterday that money was withdrawn from the bank impossible jabby's wife stone had given a previous draft to another man for the money the other man got the plunder the <laughs> drops i mean oh that we pulp mortals should so crave after the drops which perisheth don't preach oh my young brother the little word in season i wish it would choke you now who drew that money a carnal man your father's mortal enemy mr ryan 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 mr george ryan yes sir to-day your father presents a worthless paper at the bank in exchange for his breeding cattle oh how grievous a thing it is that deceitful men should so deceive themselves preparing for a sultry hereafter think of these poor dumb driven cattle exchange for a bogus draft upon a miserable miserable bank how luis jim yelled and his segundo old luis terrazas came a-flying luis take the men home i've got to go back to lordsburg stay the preacher lifted his hand brushed back the hat from his face and stared into jim's eyes chalk davies is yonder at lordsburg thar you can't trust him eh send a letter to chalkeye ask him to wire the sheriff at albuquerque to hold that thar train of cattle pending inquiries i'm going back myself you stand aside sir if you don't ride straight for holy cross you ain't going to see your mother alive she's sinking rapid how do you know what's happening at holy cross at grave city and at lordsburg and all these places a hundred miles apart have i said anything boy that you can't believe you lied when you said you were thirsty when you claimed to have walked when you made out you couldn't patch your horse and couldn't ride you lied and you're a liar the preacher reached for his hip and a dozen revolvers covered him instant sir he said quite gentle my handkerchief is in my hip pocket observe me blow my nose at your remarks he trumpeted into his big red handkerchief why do you make this bluff says jim at being a preacher when you've been all your life in the saddle your questions sir are personal for a stranger and the character you gave me to your creases was some hasty and the salute of guns you offer makes me feel unworthy as to your thanks for an honest warning to save your lost cattle and haste to your dying mother jim flushed with shame i beg your pardon sir and you accept my warning if you prove you forgive me by shaking hands mister mister just call me friend no more and jim when you've been to holy cross your natural feelings will call you swift to grave city where you'll find your father in mortal danger i fear in mortal danger unless said the stranger a mere friend can save him jim looked into the stranger's face at the tanned hide seamed and furrowed with trouble the strong hard lips twisted with a sort of queer smile at the eyes which seemed to be haunted sir he said i'll do what you tell me so he took paper and pencil from his wallet leaned over the horn of the saddle and made it desk enough for what he had to write will this do says he passing his letter to the stranger yes i reckon add sonny that mr michael ryan's private kyle is due from the east to-morrow with the pacific express it's time to reach grave city at ten o five p m chalkeye will be there 
Jim wrote all that down, then looked up, fearful, surprised at this preacher knowing so much, then glanced all round to see which man had the best horse for his message. Oh, naughty, he called. See, si, senor, take this letter, oh, naughty, to Mr. Chalkeye Davies in Lordsburg. Then you'll follow me home. Onati uncovered, took the letter, and bowed his thanks. Gracias, senor. Adios. And curved off swift for Lordsburg. Then Jim saw the preacher's eyes boring him through. You will shake hands? he asked. With a glad hand, said Captain McCalman. Put her thar, boy. I hope when we meet up again, you'll remember me as a friend. So the great robber swung his horse and spurred up back to his hilltop while Jim and the vaqueros burn the trail for home end of chapter seven chapter eight of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter eight in the name of the people it used to be a great sight down at holy cross when the vaqueros came back from the round-up, serapes flapping in the wind, hats waving, guns popping, ponies tearing around, and heating up the ground. And then the house folk came swarming out to meet them, the little boys and dogs in a shouting heap, the girls bunched together and squealing, the young wives laughing, the old mothers, the tottering granddads, all plumb joyful to welcome the riders home so they would mix up, crowd through the gates, and on the stable court to see a beef shot for the feast. Presently, the little boys would come out in the dusk of the evening, bareback to herd the ponies through the pasture gate, and scamper back barefoot to the house in time for supper. All night long, the lamps were alight in the great hall, the guitars a-strumming and young feet dancing, and last, at the break of dawn, the chapel bell would call for early mass. But this was the last homecoming for the folks at Holy Cross, and far away across the desert, Jim's riders heard the bell, the minute bell tolling soft for the dead. The people met them at the gates, but all the boys uncovered, riding slow. No beef would be killed that night. No lights would shine. No guitars would strum for the dance. Inside the main gate, Jim's servant took his horse, and the lad walked on with clashing spurs to meet the old padre at the door of the dining hall. Take off your spurs, said the priest. Come softly. So he followed the padre across the bare, whitewashed dining hall, and on along the cloister of the palm tree court. He heard the death cry keening out of the shadows. The bell tolled and he went on through the dark rooms until he came to the senora with women kneeling about the bed and candles lighted at her head and feet the daybreak was bitter cold when jim came out into the palm tree court shivering while he watched the little bar of clouds flushed with the dawn he felt that something was all wrong in the house with the hollow echoes every time he moved crashing back from out of the dark then, in the black darkness of the rooms, he saw a lighted candle moving, slow through the air. "'Who's there?' he shouted, and at that the light came straight at him, with something gray behind. "'Who are you? What are you doing here?' Then he saw it was Sheriff Bryan. "'Easy, boy, easy,' says Dick in his slow Texan drawl. "'I calculate, Jim. We may as well have coffee, eh, boy?' So he led Jim into the dining room, where he had cooked some coffee on the brazier. He set his candle down on the long table, and beside it a stick of sealing wax and a bundle of tape. "'Why, Sheriff,' says Jim, "'what do you want with these?' "'Take your coffee, son. It's cold this morning.' Jim fell to sipping his coffee, while old Dick sat crouched down over the brazier. My old woman's been here this fortnight past, he said, and I collected a doctor of sorts. You never sent for father or for me. I had my reasons, boy, good reasons. Jim, 
thar's trouble a coming and you've got to face it manful oh speak out as i says to my old woman only yesterday i'd have loaned the money myself to your poor mother only i don't have enough to lend to a dog what do you mean i couldn't turn the poor lady out of her home so i got a stay of execution from the court to give her time to escape she's done escape now and i got to act sheriff yes i'm sheriff and i'd rather break a leg but i'm the people's servant jim and my orders is to seize this hull estate in the name of the people to seize this house to turn you and all your servants out of holy cross and put the people's seal on the front gate sheriff you can't boy take this writ jim took the paper spread it out and read jim said the sheriff we must bury this lady first then you want to take the best hoss you've got while i'm not looking and ride to my home you're more than welcome thought who's done this thing your father's debts don't beat about the bush who's done this thing george ryan End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Nine War Signs. On Tuesday morning, after I headed Jim for Holy Cross, I had to stay over in Lawrenceburg, finish my horse deal with the Lawson Cattle Company, then get my men back to Grave City by the evening train. I had only three cowboys monte custer and you nice children too when they were all asleep but fresh that morning full of dumb yearnings for trouble and showing plentiful symptoms of being young at breakfast time i pointed out some items in the local scenery a doctor's shambles a hospital a mortuary and an adjacent graveyard now you kids says i you may be heap big tigers but don't you get wildcatting around too numerous because i ain't aimin to waste good money on your funerals they said they'd be fearful good and might they have ten dollars apiece for the church offertory they set off with three pure hearts and thirty dollars now i reckon there were twenty-five flying w riders owning the town that day and they began politely by asking my boys if chalkeye's squint was contagious and whether that accounted for symptoms of mange in his ponies my boys were dead gentle and softly answered that lawson was the worst horse thief in arizona that lawson's foreman was three parts negro and the rest polecat and that lawson's riders had red streaks around their poor throats because the hang rope had failed to do them justice the flying w inquired if my three riders was a case of triplets or only an unfortunate mistake then my boys produced their six guns and allowed they'd been whelped savage raised dangerous and turned loose hostile and i only arrived just in time to save them from being spoiled for further use on earth i challenge the flying w to race their best pets against my mangy ponies and both sides agreed to have a drink with me instead of wasting mounted funeral pageants on such a one-horse town as little lordsburg so while i was playing nursemaid herding all those kids who should roll up the street but young onati of holy cross on the dead run with a letter from jim the more kids the worse trouble well when i had swallowed jim's letter i fired off a batch of telegrams and soon had a wire back from the albuquerque sheriff we'll impound them cattle says he pending advices from bryant so i sent onati streaking after bryant and went on playing at nursemaid until i was plumb scared that i'd be sprouting a cap of ribbons 
anyway i didn't have time to think until the evening train pulled into grave city by that time my three babies were dancing a fandango upon the roof of the car when the train stopped i hauled them down by the legs petted them some with my boot and told them to go away home they went with a bet between them which would be first at my range just for the sake of peace and quietness i stayed that night in grave city and sat around next morning smoking long cigars while i made my poor brain think there were points in jim's letter and facts i had picked up casual at lordsburg and words of gossip dropped in the hotel but to put them all together would have puzzled a large-sized judge still by all the tracks the signs the signals and the little smells i reckoned that mr ryan was mighty near reaching a crisis and apt to break out sudden as dynamite first here was sheriff ryan with two deputies his wife and a medicine man camped down at holy cross now bryant would scarcely take deputy sheriffs down there to nurse a sick lady had holy cross been seized at last for balshannon's debts that smell of ryan secondly jim had gone to heaps of trouble gathering all the breeding stock of holy cross for a party named jabez y stone to steal them convenient jabez y had once been a bartender in ryan's hotel so that smelled of ryan too third here was poor balshannon being held with a string round his leg at the sepulchre saloon by the two crookedest gamblers in arizona the same being low-lived joe and louisiana pete once joe being jailed for killing a mexican ryan had put up money for a lawyer to get him released so if these two thugs were instructed to hold and skin the duke that likewise smelt strong of ryan fourthly here was young michael ryan in his private car from new york burning the rails to reach grave city by ten o'clock this night the smell of ryan surely tainted the whole landscape now just throw back to the words of ryan's letter which fourteen long years before he had nailed upon the door of holy cross the time will come when driven from this your new home without a roof to cover you or a crust to eat your wife and son turned out to die in the desert you will beg for even so much as a drink of water and it will be thrown in your face i shall not die until i have seen the end of your accursed house so this was ryan's plan the work of fourteen years industrious a whole lot and plenty treacherous but coming surely true he had waited until he knew the lady was mostly dead then turned her out of holy cross to die in the desert the cattle were stolen balshannon was tied down for slaughter and michael would come to see the finish at ten o'clock tonight i began to reckon up balshannon's friends cowboys and robbers mostly scattered anyway across the big range of the desert they would not hear me if i howled for help but ryan was respectable he was chairman of the committee of public safety which lynched bad men when they became too prevalent with their guns ryan was our leading citizen heaps rich and virtuous no end the law would side with him and as to the officers of the law judges and city marshal and the police they got elected because he spoke for them he owned the city could bring out hundreds of men to take his side what could i do against this ryan's friends i knew that young curly was hid in grave city somewheres and after a search i found him the boy was so disguised he hardly knew himself chalkeye says he you want to talk he looked sort of scared and anxious i do if ryan spoke see you make him talk with me they'll think there's some new plot against the white man just you watch where i go and follow casual he led me to a little room he rented over a barber shop and looking from the window i noticed that ryan's hotel was just across the street 
curly left the room door open because he didn't want any spy to use the keyhole now says he make your voice tame or we'll be overheard don't show yourself off at that window but keep your eye skin thar while i watch the stairs what is your trouble where are your range wolves they're a whole lot absent says curly can't you trust me i ain't trustin even myself he looked fearful and worried you know that ryan has seized holy cross this morning yes and that ryan has stolen all their breeding stock yesterday that was and that your father dressed himself up as a preacher and warned jim they met up five miles south of lordsburg yes sir and that bow shannon is tied up here to be butchered this evening well kirk i want the range wolves to save balshannon the range wolves has another engagement so you know all about this curly can't you trust me to help we want no help i reckon i turned my tongue loose then and surely burned young curly don't talk so loud old chalka but say some more he laughed i could set around to listen to you all day turn your wolf loose for it's short your time to howl that dried me up cold and sudden for i had been acting youthful and curly had got responsible maybe elderly with me the same being ridiculous seeing how small the boy was you're through with your prayers chalkeye some comforted eh you old ring-tailed snorter can't you understand we ain't going to have you mixed up with us range wolves and branded for an outlaw we want you to keep good and be a whole lot respectable right along then you can stay around in this man's town walk in the open with a proud tail and show the ryan outfit that balshannon has one friend who ain't no robber then i understood now says curly hear my little voice for i'm going to prophecy you know that ryan reckons to have young michael here for balshannon's funeral suppose this michael don't transpire tonight suppose the train comes in with news of a horrible shocking outrage suppose them mean ordinary robbers has stole a millionaire suppose well just you wait for ryan's yell when he hears what's done happened to his petted offspring he'll surely forget there's any balshannon to kill just you wait peaceful and when the town turns out to rescue that poor stolen maverick you want to ride in and collect balshannon opposite in the hotel piazza i watched old ryan and the city marshal having a mint julep together at one of the tables you hear that hoss says curly and far off i heard a horse come thundering soon the rider swung into sight pitching a dust high until he came abreast of my window and saw the city marshal in the piazza marshal i heard him calling the wire to bisley has been cut is that so the city marshal at bisley wants your help what's the trouble you ryan your partner jim fiskin has been held up on the mule pass by robbers marshal the message is for you to bring a posse swift to the nigh end of the pass so as the bisley people can drive the robbers under your guns good says the marshal belting up his gun i'll be thar it would be an awful pity says curly behind my shoulder if our city marshal and his posse of men got called away on a false scent while the wicked robbers up north were stealing a millionaire that youngster was wiser than me End of chapter nine